defined by a psychological understanding of their sexual desires. Uh, This psychologized self is the real me. And so to deny this is a denial of myself, a denial of not just what I like to do, but of my personhood. And so the closest billboard to my house right now says, you shouldn't have to make an excuse for your identity. That sign probably wouldn't make much sense to us 20 years ago. But we live in a world where that now makes sense. We, we understand what what's being communicated. Uh, we, we live in a world where people believe we're devi- defined by sexual desires. And so whatever direction our sexual desires are turned, that's who I am. That's my identity, and I need to be able to express it. Or we might think we're defined by material wealth. Uh, I derive my sense of worth based on my net worth. And this can be subtle for us. Uh, Maybe I feel like a failure because I can't get over that next threshold. There's these expectations put on us or by me, and I'm a failure because I can't get over that bar. I just can't get to the next tax bracket. Uh, The next promotion is just always out of reach. And so when I think of others, one of the first things I think about is, are they rich? Or are they poor? Maybe I don't ask myself that out loud, but it's how I categorize people. This is what defines them because this is what defines me. Or we might think we're defined by our relationships. My social networks tell me who I am. Do I have friends and are they cool? If they're cool and I have them, then I'm valuable. But now I have no friends and so I'm worthless. Congregation, we could go on. The world has a full range of ways to define us. In fact, the world even has an undefined option on the menu, if you want it. Um, Humanity is defined by absurdity. Life is absurd. This is where atheism will eventually lead you. Everything's meaningless. There's no definitions. Absurdity. Now, what we need to see is that we all have sampled from the world's menu. We all have. We all have bought into some form of these ideas or others about ourselves, and it is affecting the way that we live. Some of us to a greater degree, others of us to a lesser degree by God's sanctifying grace, but all of us, we need our minds renewed. None of us walked in here without that need. And so... Again, the question comes to us, what defines you? What defines you? It must not be our own thoughts of ourselves or the philosophies of this world, but it must be the word of God. And it must be God himself who has the ability to define us, to tell us who we are and what we are. Friends, God made us, God defines us, God tells us who we are, and so this morning we need to come humbly and submissively to Scripture, and as we do, we discover liberating, life-giving truths again, because there's a good creator behind this, the one who's speaking here. And so God here, notice, says we are made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? And there's three words I'm going to give us uh, this morning, three things it means. Made in the image of God is the title, three points, and we'll spend... The bulk of our time with the first one, and that's okay. The first word is dignity. Dignity. Notice verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And notice the Lord's logic here. As he gives this command, this, this warning of judgment on those who will murder others. Notice the Lord has, has a reason for doing so. And, and you see it there in the text, and the Lord is saying there's a unique dignity that he has given to humanity. Do you see it? Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Why? What's the logical reason for in the image of God he made man? 
And if you just widen your view a little bit on the context here, in the previous verses, God has already been drawing this dividing line, separating humanity from the rest of creation. So the plants and the animals are given to humanity by God as a gift for them to enjoy. They're even allowed to to eat these things, plants and animals. They're gifts by the creator to to humanity. But notice, humanity must not murder another man. And the reason why is what God tells us, for in the image of God, he made man. So God is saying there is a unique dignity here that he has assigned to human beings. Now, what is this image of God expressing? And and what we're saying here is it's expressing something about who we are. It's expressing about something of the nature of our being, that he is defined. And and so who are we? If we were to come towards a a working definition, it might sound something like this. Uh, We were made as dignified moral, and religious creatures. We were made by God as dignified, moral, and religious creatures. And all of those words are important there, so let me explain this. And it's so important because this is very different than the world, what the world is offering us today. Uh, On the one hand, the world, we either dehumanize humanity, we're just a creature, we're just an animal, plants, animals, people, all kind of the same dehumanizing humanity. Or on the other hand, this world will will deify humanity. We are God. We can say my truth and my truth then is the truth because I'm God. And both of those are wrong. They're wrong. The Bible says we are dignified creatures. And, And children, you remember how This is pictured beautifully in the creation story, don't you? Where God made our first father, Adam, from the dust. We're not God. That's foolishness to think we're God. God made us, and he made us from the dust. Weakness, creaturely, from the earth. And yet, dignified. Because remember what God then did with that dust? As it were, he takes it and he intimately breathes the breath of life into this dust. And in doing so, God, the great artist, is taking particular care in crafting humanity. Uh, He spoke light into existence. Uh, He speaks other things into existence. And yet God comes close and he takes particular care to breathe into this dust to form this beautiful man. And then God works as the first surgeon and he puts man to sleep, thankfully, before he makes the cut and removes the rib. And it's from the rib that he then makes the woman, Eve. And Genesis 1.27 is very clear that God made man and woman equally in his image. He made them different, But he gave them an equal dignity, man and woman. And that's revolutionary teaching uh, that's been handed down to us in written form from God through Moses. And it's been time tested for 3,500 years since Moses wrote this. That women are of equal dignity as a man. That's astounding if you compare it to the other ancient works of the world. And so there's not an infinite variety of options as to how we can be image bearers. Notice there's two. God made us male or female, and that is who we are. And so constitutionally, we've been saying we are different from other creatures. Uh, Just think about it. Only humans have a body and a soul united together. Uh, And these aren't um, two separate parts of us, as it were, that can be easily separated, body and soul. No, no, we are one organic whole, embodied souls, you might say, is probably the better way to think about it. Not two parts, but an embodied soul. And so death, then, is the violent, unnatural, ripping apart what God has joined together. And this is important because we might be tempted to think that just the soul is in the image of God, but again, that's 
That's Gnosticism, where it's valuing the soul and, and devaluing the body. No, no, the Bible gives us a different way. God made us body and soul together, the whole person being in the image of God. And so our souls are of infinite value, as we'll hear. They're immortal, and yet our bodies are extremely valuable, made by God. So we are dignified creatures, but we are moral creatures, uh, Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made man upright, morally upright. He made humanity righteous. And, and elsewhere, Romans 2, for example, uh, 14 and 15, he writes his law on our hearts. And, and in the garden, we love that law because it's a good law and we were good. And God gave us a conscience to help us. And, and so we were made holy, set apart for the creator. We were moral. We are moral creatures. And he made us religious creatures, meaning he made us to know him and to worship him. And so this is true of all of us. We can't escape this about ourselves. We are morally responsible creatures, and we are all worshipers. That religious drive to worship something is baked into our human nature and can't be unbaked, can't be removed. And so it's not a question of if we are worshiping something, but it's a question of what or who we are worshiping because of how God made us. Now, at this point, it's helpful to say, but hold on, what about the fall? What about the fall? I'm here in Genesis 1, I'm here in Genesis 2. What about the fall? Does humanity still have dignity after the fall? Now, of course, we cannot overemphasize uh, the travesty that the rebellion, our rebellion in Adam has had upon us, the devastating effects on us. Uh, the fall has, has reversed, really, the core of our moral fabric. The biblical language for this is we have a hard heart or a dead heart. At the very command center, our hearts are, are wrong, are tainted, are defiled, are depraved. And so we know this in life. We don't need to teach our children how to sin. Of course, we can be examples of sin and further that in them. But we don't need to teach them how to sin. We need to teach them how to not sin. We're no longer righteous. But we are unrighteous. Notice we're moral creatures, so we can't be neutral. No longer righteous, but now unrighteous. No longer holy, but now in ourselves, unholy no longer do I have a knowledge of God left to myself. Now I'm ignorant about God and I'm making images of him in my mind. I've exchanged God for false gods. And so it is devastating what we've become. And yet, congregation, here is why our text is so important. Because Romans or Genesis 9 verse 6 is here after the fall. It's here after the flood, and God is saying humanity is still made in the image of God in a certain important sense. Yes, though the core and heart of our being is rotten and naturally depraved, yet we still carry the broad sense of the image of God, and so there still is great dignity to humanity. God is saying we must value human life as uniquely different from animals, there's value he has placed in that. Okay, so what defines you? What defines you? It must be God's word. And here's the application we want to make under the first point. Do you know your true identity? Do you know your true identity? And it's a critical topic. It hit our dinner table this week. I'm not sure if you've heard the big news, but... A Paw Patrol spinoff called Rubble and Crew introduced a non-binary character named River. And so that hit our table because Paw Patrol is a precious uh, show in the family, um, one of the favorite shows, and yet now we needed to say, hold on. It's a show that moving forward is teaching boys that Boys can be girls, and girls can be boys, and moms can be dads, and dads can be moms. And that's not healthy. That's not true. God made us. He made, he made me a man. He made mom a woman. And so we can enjoy the old episodes. But moving forward, it's not worth it. And so the point is this. 
who we are is not located in what we feel as we further this application. Yes, our feelings are real. We won't deny that. Yes, our feelings are powerful. We won't deny that either. And yet, our feelings can be deceived. They are tainted in sin. And so, congregation, we cannot trust our feelings or desires. What we can trust is this, God's word. This is what he says about me. I am made in his image. And so for me, that's me as a man being an image bearer of him. And my biology confirms this. And maybe for you, it's as a woman and your biology confirms it. And now even here, yes, we must acknowledge there are a very few situations where due to the fall, it's hard to determine based on biology alone what sex we might be. There are things called deformities. And that's difficult and painful, of course. And yet, even for such a person, we can find comfort in the truth that God made me. And he is not confused even as we deal with the effects of the fall. Well, there are so many applications here. Uh, this impacts, let me just take one, this impacts what we think about our body. God made me, and so I had absolutely no say in how big uh, my ears are, how large my nose is, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God chose all that for me. And so I can spend this life fighting that or learning to surrender to my good creator. And I don't say this in a glib way because we can really struggle over this and we can and should seek help if we are. There's good help available. But let me just give a few suggestions that can help us. Uh, number one, it is right to grieve over deformities. It is right to grieve over deformities. Cracks in God's creation. Uh, we are all like beautiful vases that have been chipped and cracked and pieced back together this side of the fall. And, and so for the Christian, if I am in Christ, I'm waiting for that day when I'll be perfectly remade in the new heavens and new earth. No cracks, no deformities. So it is appropriate now, yes, to grieve in a right way over deformities. Jesus died to pay for sin but he also died to remove all the effects of the curse. He thought that was important, not only to save the soul, but to save the body and to make it new in that final day. But second, praise God for what he's given you. Whatever it is he's given you, praise God. Psalm 139 is a helpful place to go. Verse 13, you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I wonder, when you stand in front of the mirror or whatever, you have thoughts of yourself, is this coming to mind? Or is it only, I'm ugly, I'm not shaped the right way, I'm whatever, whatever, whatever. If so, I am substituting my thoughts and letting them speak louder than God's word. I need to let this come in. You made me, and therefore I will praise you. I will praise you. I'm longing maybe for a better day, but I will praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You have said it, God. And then third, there's perspective. We must remember that people, and, and I heard this said this week, so this doesn't come for me, but we must remember that people who are given physical beauty in this life are like people who are born rich, and who end up beggars. See what that is saying? If we are given physical beauty in this life, we're born rich because we look maybe great when we're young. And then one day we're going to end up beggars because we're just, it seems like our money is always running away from us if we're just locked on youthful looks and natural beauty. It's slipping away and I can't stop it. And the faster we lay hold of that, actually, the more peace we can find. So, friend, what is your value? What is your value? Uh, if you're thinking worthless, then you're not hearing God. And what you need to do is hear what God says, that he values his human creatures as more than the birds which he cares for. And so there's dignity. That's the first word we wanted to spend some time on. Second, duty. Duty. This is another key thing that comes from the image of God. What, what defines your purpose? What dictates your duties? Again, it must be God's word, not my own ideas. 
And we find this then in, encapsulated in this central concept of being an image bearer. It's not merely a statement of who we are. That's what we've been focusing on, um, our constitutional identity. But it's actually a functional thing. We're not, we're not, we aren't only image bearers. We are called to live as image bearers, as those who bear God's image. Uh, this is our purpose. This is our role in God's creation. It's our, it's our responsibility. And so let me give you three things, which I'll just hit briefly, of, of what we're called to be. Number one, we're called to represent the king. We're called to represent the king. The Bible, uh, it speaks of God's creation as this cosmic temple that he has fashioned. And if you were living in Moses' day, there would be other temples all over this world. Uh, temples in Egypt that he would have been familiar with. And, and if he would have walked into the temple, there would have been an image and so, maybe most famously, children, you know the story of Dagon, right? What happens when the, ult- with the Ark of God comes into Dagon's temple? Well, Dagon, the image of Dagon, falls flat on his face because he's a false god. But in the temples, my point is, in these temples, there were images that represented the gods. And the Bible holds out creation as God's temple, and God says there's to be no graven image in this creation, Why? Because I have made man in the image of God. And so you see the point? The huge privilege and responsibility that's given to each of us is to represent God. The way, one way God makes himself visible in this creation is not by having graven images made of him, but by having man made in his image. And so, this then is an important part of our duty, and it leads to the second thing that is helping us understand our purpose. We're made to represent the king and his loving rule in the world, but how, secondly, by reflecting the king. By reflecting the king. And and here, we can think, children, helpfully of the image bearer is, is meant to be like a mirror. It's meant to reflect. And so, We're meant to reflect God to this world, to to show this world, to show creation what God is like. And and so the moral character of God, of course, is what we're talking about here, because God is not, he doesn't have a body. But the moral character of God is what we're meant to show to creation. Uh, Be holy, for I am holy. God is holy, and we are meant to derivatively show what that means through holiness. Um, I am righteous. He is, he is the Lord. He is righteous. And, and so we're to show what that looks like, righteousness. He is gracious. We're, we're to show what that looks like. He is good. We're meant to show what that looks like. And so the way we live and act is meant to show others what the king is like. That's what it means to be an image bearer. And so, friend, I hope you feel the responsibility. By my own standards, I can be doing okay. By God's standards, when I recognize this is what I was made for, it's starting to show me, left to myself, I'm not doing okay. And third, this is even revealed more when we think of the third thing, we're called to rejoice in the king. uh, To rejoice in the king. To enjoy relationship with the king, but to have reverence and and joy in my good God who made me, who's given me everything. And the best way then of showing to creation and to other humans that God is, is, is lovely, the best way to show his loveliness is by being captivated by it myself. It's one thing to say he's lovely and then to pay no attention to him. That doesn't show anyone that he's lovely. But when I'm captivated by his loveliness, when I see his beauty, and when I uh, reverence him for his glory, uh, then I'm rejoicing in the king and letting him be made known to others. This is what I was made for. This is my purpose. Called to image God. And friends, all of this then highlights the seriousness of our rebellion, doesn't it? Um, We have turned on our king 
In Adam, we have rebelled, and, and Adam's rebellion has made us rebels. And so now, catechism students, we learned that our hearts are prone by nature not to do these things, but instead to hate God and our neighbor, our fellow image bearer. Uh, that's what's now going on in our natural hearts and coming forth from our natural hearts. Uh, we don't fulfill these good purposes we were made for. In ourselves, we aren't living as image bearers. And so think about what this does in terms of our understanding of sin. Yes, sin is a lack of conformity to the law of God. It's rebellion against God. All of that is true, and we need to hear that. But there's another angle that this presents to us. Sin is the most dehumanizing thing possible. Because it takes me away from my original purpose as a human being. And so often, Satan's lie is the opposite, right? We just need to act on what feels good, and I need to have this because then, I, then I'll be myself. And no, 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 that's actually us unraveling ourselves further. All sin is a deviation of what God has made us to be and the purpose God has given us. So where does that leave us? Our final word is destiny. Destiny. Where we're headed, that's also encapsulated in this idea of image of God. Destiny. Uh, as the crown jewel that has rebelled against our king, it's obvious we deserve punishment. And the destiny for all who remain in this state of rebellion, the Bible is clear. Uh, it's a state of punishment, of eternal punishment, because we will eternally be hating God, eternally asserting ourselves over against the king. And so we will, in the end, experience the eternal punishment of that. When we die, our, our souls live on forever. They're immortal. And, and then on the resurrection, when Jesus comes back, he will raise our bodies. And, and then there's no more second chances, no more corrections, no more ways to fix this. But we will be locked in the state to which we have chosen at that point of rebellion against this king and to forever be imprisoned in hell as a rebel. Friends, that is the horrible destiny that comes to those who continue to fight against the king who made them so well as the crown jewel of his creation. And so, congregation, really, we're in a bind here. Uh, we have dignity on one hand. We've failed our duty on the other hand, terribly failed it. And so we're not enough. We can't find our worth in ourselves. We try to find worth in ourselves just alone, just me in myself. And I won't be able to find it because as I continue to peer into myself, I, I just see there's more sin, there's more depravity. And so that's a dead end. Don't go there. Instead, come to the hope of the gospel. That's what the Bible is leading us all to see. The hope of the gospel is actually addressing our problems here. Um, when we come to the New Testament, the image of God takes on a distinct note. And you could trace this through. Suddenly, the image of God is no longer so much talking about us, but about the image of God, Jesus Christ. And so over and over again, you, you start to hear this expression, the image of God, the perfect express image of God, Hebrews 1.3. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, Colossians 1.15, he is the preeminent one over creation. He is the, the image of the invisible God. Jesus is. And so Christ is the complete image of God. He is the last Adam who restores fallen image bearers. And so friend, if you are a rebel, then your destiny is hell and yet Jesus reasons with you this morning. Why will you give your soul for this world that's passing away? But Jesus isn't only here to, to reason with you. He doesn't just ask the question. He's done something about it. He's taken a true human nature to himself. He lived as a true man, perfectly loving God, perfectly loving his neighbor. And then he went to the cross and there he bore the excruciating curse and penalty that's due to our sin, to our rebellion, to our failure to reflect the king, to represent him and to rejoice in him. Christ has taken that all upon himself, the God-man, to pay for it. 
And so friends, this is the glorious hope, the gospel hope this morning that's found here in Scripture. And it's this, that it's in the incarnate image of God, in Jesus Christ, we find one who is rescuing and restoring us if we are coming to him. The incarnate image of God is the one who rescues and restores us into his image. The gospel remedy is Christ. It's Christ. And and so the question is, is your life defined by Christ? What defines you? Uh, Where are you finding your worth? Is your life shaped and molded by being united to the true image of God? Is that where you're finding your value? And so, friends, the world will say, find it in all these different places, and yet here's what the Bible is saying. And here's where we can actually find something far better than self-help. The Bible is saying, come to Christ, be united to Christ, the one who is enough in every way. The one who is accepted by the Father for his perfection, the one who is rewarded by the Father for the way he excelled in keeping the law the way he then was crushed for those who break the law. And if you're united to him, then Christian, you have glorious hope this morning. And the question for us is, are we allowing ourselves to be defined by him? Here's what I mean. Are we allowing what Jesus says about his people to take defining influence in my life? Do I allow his statements about his people, his love for his people, the beauty of his people, the way he sees his people to penetrate my heart? Do I allow his opinion to matter most? Congregation, we need to be defined by Christ. We need to hide our life in him, Colossians 3 says. And he says it in the way that this is your reality for the Christian. Your life is hid in God. Now learn to enjoy that. Learn to discover what that means. Uh, Pursue this Christ. Know this Christ. Uh, Know that, yes, uh, you are loved by God as as one of his creatures, but far more than that, as an adopted son or daughter, because of his grace, uh, you you are a prince or princess in the eternal kingdom. And yes, because of that, he has this plan to remake your body, to, to remake your soul, to rid it of all impurities. And what we're seeing now, what we're experiencing now is just a blip on the timeline of eternity. And so what defines you? Do you want self-esteem? Well, it actually comes by looking away from yourself and humbling yourself before Christ and then learning to receive his tender words over you. My beloved my delight. Do you want purpose? He holds it out. Live for me. Uh, Live for me now, uh, imperfectly, but with my spirit, seeking to honor God, seeking to rejoice in him, seeking to uh, live according to his law as he graciously teaches us and leads us in his way. And all of this, what is God's purpose in this? Romans 8, 29 tells us, God, his purpose is to conform us into the image of his firstborn son. So that the last day, Jesus will be able to present to the Father many siblings. That is glorious. Uh, Many siblings who who reflect Christ, and on that day, will see Christ and reflect him perfectly. And so, yes, this is a process that's still incomplete, But we will see Christ. We will be made like Christ. We will be the younger siblings sharing in his glory. And what a day that will be because we won't just bear the image of Adam who could fall. We will bear the image of Christ who can never fall, forever united to him, never able to resist God's purposes again. This is the believer's destiny. Friend, you have hope. It's only in Christ. And this is where you find it. Your purposes in your life is fulfilled in the one who is the perfect image of God and who will remake that in you. Amen.